Well, this is Dr. Stan back here at Radio Liberty, coming to from the hills overlooking beautiful and picturesque Monterey Bay and, and bringing you the news behind the news, the story behind the story. Hoping to convince you that reality is usually scoffed at, that illusion is usually king. But in the battle for the survival of Christian civilization, it's going to be reality and not illusion or delusion that's going to determine what the future will bring. And I need to remind you of the views expressed here are not necessarily those of the owners, management, staff, sponsors, or supporters of the station you're listening to. They happen to be my views, and for the next hour, they're going to be the views of our good friend, Dr. Dennis Cuddy. Hi, Dr. Cuddy. How are we doing? Oh, I'm uh, hanging in there as usual. Just All right. Watching the events unfold as I uh, sort of predicted. All right, fine. Well, why don't you just uh, go right ahead now? We've been, of course, going through your book, but ordinarily you do have some comments on some of the things going on. But we, certainly we've been talking about uh, Dr. Cuddy's book, uh, The Power Elite, uh, their, uh, uh, their uh, history and their future, but go right ahead. What are we going to be talking about today? Well, that's... Uh that's what we'll be talking about, uh, but uh, as usual, I try to give some sort of relevant uh, uh, contemporary analysis that uh, fits. And uh, on the cover of the book, The Parallel to Their History and Future, which is offered by Radio Liberty, I put on the front cover a, uh, a unique uh, design uh, of a coin that is uh, supposed to come out in 2018. It's, uh, we titled it the World Phoenix 2018 because that's uh, the plan for the global currency. And I've been uh, saying that uh, for some time. And so what's relevant to the book is a, a recent interview uh, by a fellow your listeners may, may know, they may not, uh, named Jim Rogers. Uh, Jim Rogers was the... Uh, co-founder of uh, George Soros's uh, Quantum Fund. He's uh, supposed to be a rather famous investor, and uh, the headline from the uh, news item that I have from the Canadian Broadcasting uh, Corporation when they interviewed him was that uh, the, um, uh, he issued a dire warning, uh, and it was that this uh, this uh, whole situation today globally is going to, as he said, end badly. It will end badly. And the, what he was um, talking about was uh, the upcoming crisis. And that's what I've said. Uh, I've said that uh, this year, next year, you'll see the stock market actually doing pretty good. See, people in the past, first of all, the, the geniuses, the Rush Limbaugh's and the Sean Hannity's, the Glenn Beck's were predicting that Obama wouldn't win. And I said, well, yeah, he will because that's part of the plan. Uh, and uh, then they said, well, there'll be this huge economic crisis. And I said, well, yeah, but not now. It's, it's, you know, they're all predicting, well, this, this is horrible, and the economy's going in the tank. And, and even now, they are correctly, correctly uh, talking about certain um, things that are going on, which I will probably write about in an upcoming column. I'm, I'm doing a um, four-part series now on News with Views, but one of my upcoming columns, uh, columns on that will be planned, planned incompetence. Uh, it's sort of like Gamble Abdul Nasser said back in the 50, 1950s when he said, you Americans don't make uh, simple, stupid mistakes. You make complicated, stupid mistakes, which makes us very suspicious. And that's, that's basically true, and it's, it's what they do all along. And so I've decided to title that subject, and I'll go back about that time and bring it on up to the future, planned incompetence. In other words, we look like we're, we're stupid and doing something incompetent, and in the normal sense of things, for the average person's perspective, it is. It is stupid and incompetent. The Obamacare is stupid and incompetent. But it's really not. Uh, you say, well, what do you mean? That's a contradiction. Well, it is stupid and incompetent and on the face of it, but actually is part of a very, very careful, planned, planned incompetence. And uh, so what uh, Jim Rogers said... Uh, regarding this, uh, we'll pick up after the break, but it, it fits. It fits with this. It fits with the cover of my book. It fits with the whole plan that I've been describing for some time, and I'll explain it after we get back. And I think basically, of course, the outcome of the Obamacare is going to be just to crumble the whole uh, health care delivery system, and I feel the same thing is going to happen as far as certainly our monetary system is going to simply go down. Oh. 
Well, this is Dr. Stan. Our guest this afternoon is Dr. Dennis Cuddy, and Dr. Cuddy has certainly taught at the university level. He's been a consultant for industry. Uh, he certainly was in the oh, in the Reagan administration, the Department of Education, there under the Ronald Reagan. But he's a prolific writer and certainly one of my favorite sources of information. And he's ordinarily with us every Friday at this time. And he's simply talking a little bit about what's going on today. And but with so many of the things going on, just don't make any sense. I mean, how could you be as stupid as they are with Obamacare? I mean, to come up with a program, you had three years to put together a, 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 a computer program so people can sign up and it just doesn't work. And it still doesn't work. And basically, people 55 years of age are going to have a three or four times increase in the cost of their health care. And I pointed out my son is 55. And basically, his health care is going, uh, this is a, a basically... A, a catastrophic policy it doesn't pay the first dollar. It pays maybe f- a three or four thousand or five thousand dollars, something like that. But his policy is going to go from four thousand to fourteen thousand dollars a year, and apparently this is happening to almost everybody in that. Uh, of, but how could they be so stupid as to come up with a program so th- th- that is going to be such a disaster unintentionally? And it's Dr. Cuddy's point that this really isn't uh, isn't unintentional. They know exactly what they're doing, but they're trying to appear to be incompetent. Dr. Cuddy, you go right ahead. Uh, yeah, and uh, yeah, they they uh, have an incompetent rollout and. Uh, people are getting cancellation notices, and maybe 80,000 or whatever next year will get their notices of cancellation. And, oh, my goodness, uh, we can't have this, so we'll have to subsidize it. Whatever the government subsidizes, it controls, and so forth and so on. So ultimately, that's what they want. They're moving towards the single payer. So, you know, I mean, oh, they can only get there by being incompetent with what they're doing now. And so the same thing is true on the uh, international global economic scene, as I said uh, before the break, uh, people thought we'd have this economic disaster now, and I said, well, no, no, it'll, it'll still sort of fumble along, and as you see, the stock market is really rather high, but it's, it's artificial, you know, it's artificial, and so this fellow Jim Rogers, who is the co-founder of George Soros' Quantum Fund, and remember, George Soros is one of the power elite, so if you watch what he and his ilk are doing, you can pretty well find out what their plans are for the future. I mean, they're not silent. I mean, David Rockefeller gave his quote, you know, which the, the media, the New York Times covers up because they're one of the papers that the uh, uh, Cecil Rhodes people uh, wanted to control, and, and we know this. We know this from Carol Quigley. He said, they, you know, J.P. Morgan was... Hold that thought. Person. Hold that thought. We'll be back in just a moment here. Well, this is Dr. Stan here, and Dr. Cuddy is simply pointing out that the, the, the media is controlled. Certainly the most prominent newspaper in the United States, the New York Times, has been controlled for a long period of time, and it puts out the information that they want you to get. I mean, once in a while they come up with some good articles. Once in a while some of the points they take are very well taken, but there's always certainly a purpose behind it, because certainly this is one of the major means by which they control the reality of a significant segment of the American population that reads the New York Times and thinks it's reporting the news. They say, you know, all the news that's fit to print, ladies and gentlemen, the New York Times prints all the news that they want you to get, and they manipulate your reality and could largely control what is a significant part of the American public but thinks and believes. Dr. Ketty, you go right ahead. Uh, yeah, and, and just briefly regarding what, uh, what you uh, said uh, in, in some of my previous books, uh, the Secret Records Revealed, or its sequel, uh, The Globalist, I, I put that. Uh, there's a book actually titled uh, All the News That Fit. Uh, not that fits the print, but fits, and that was by their foreign editor, as I recall, I think his name was Herman Dinsmore, uh, and it, from 1950 to 1960, and that's what he said. So it's not just my opinion. Here you have a New York Times foreign editor, and he said, All the News That Fits was the title, and his particular slant on that was how uh, they covered up uh, Castro being a communist and other things. They just covered it up. He admitted it. You know, later on he just, yeah, yeah, that's what we did. And so this this is not just, you know, my speculation. 
And uh, like, he, like Dr. Stan was saying about today, and uh, David Rockefeller and his quote uh, the, there, and I mentioned this last week, so I'm not going to belabor it, but there was a long, long book review by David Brooks, the alleged uh, conservative contributor to the uh, New York Times. And in this long review of David Rockefeller's book, the book, he didn't even mention that, his book memoirs. He didn't even mention that quote about David Rockefeller on page 405 being uh, part of a secret cabal and conspiring against the best interests of the United States. So, you know, that's how they do it. That's they cover up. That's not just the propaganda that they push on us. It's the information that they also keep from us. So in this case, Jim Rogers is, is one of these people hooked up with George Soros, who's a power elite member. And uh, Rogers, in this uh, recent interview with the Canadian Broadcasting uh, Corporation, uh, indicated that, uh, he said, quote, we are all floating around on a sea of artificial liquidity right now, this is not going to last. And so then he proceeded to talk about the next crisis. You know, they, they had, we had the previous crisis and the mortgage crisis and the 2008 and the crisis. So he said the next crisis, and he didn't say if it occurs, he said it's going to occur. And the next crisis, he said, would occur around 2015, 2016. And that's what I said uh, before he said it. I said, it'll be okay, you know, sort of this year. It'll be a little tenuous going into 2014. But then I said, after the 2014 election, and, and remember that Obama's uh, this, this incompetence, he's kicking down the road for a year, right, which just happens to be right about the time of the November 2014 midterm elections, right? It, just, it, it doesn't just happen to be that. This is, the incompetence was planned to occur so that he could do exactly what he's doing and kicking this road, kicking this down the road till say, mm, the day after the election. <laughs> you know, in, in mid-November of 2014. Wow, what a coincidence. He's kicking the, the horrible things to come down the road until right after the November 2014 elections. What a coincidence. So anyway, it's not a coincidence. And then I said that, that what, what would happen is going into 2015 and 2016, it would be a disaster. And that's what this guy says. He says the next crisis he predicts uh, may occur. I was saying it will occur in 2015 or 2016. And then Rogers goes on and says, quote, the next correction, that's what he calls these things, they call it the correction. It's sort of a nice term, right? The next correction, when it comes, because the debt is so very high, you know, to, this is his quote, 2008 was worse than 2002 because the debt was much higher. He goes on, he says, you wait until 2015 or 2016 when the next crisis hits, debt has gone through the roof the next one's going to be really bad, end quote. His advice, quote, be prepared, be worried, and be careful, end quote. So that's what he told the Canadian Broadcasting Corporation. And he ought to know, because he's hooked up with George Soros, and this is their plan. I mean, he's putting these words like, it may occur, it may do this. Uh, that's uh, that's Bullwinkle. They, they know exactly. Exactly what's going to happen, and so in 2016, uh, by 2016, the the fat will hit the fire, and the stock market will go uh, tumbling down, and the whole world will get in a great big economic funk, and uh, uh, voila, up pops uh, Jeb Bush because you know we have to have this alternation of power, and who better to alternate power than another Bush, right? That's what they called, you know, Philip Bruno, 1792, the July issue of American Museum Magazine, talked about the, quote, hereditary elite. Now, back then, it was, you know, the kings, George I, George II, George III. But now it's dead. John D. Rockefeller, John D. Rockefeller Jr., John D. Rockefeller III, and Bush, 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 Prescott Sheldon Bush, George H.W. Bush, George W. Bush, and the brother, Jeb Bush, see? So this, you have this sort of hereditary elite and hereditary uh, puppets. And so, you know, the Bushes are more or less the puppets. Uh, so George H.W. Bush was a puppet. George W. Bush is a puppet. Jeb Bush is a puppet. And, you know, Obama's a puppet. Clinton, <laughs> all these, most of these presidents are Woodrow Wilson, you know, FDR, whoever, are, are puppets. 
And so you have the apparently the George Soros is saying, and uh, this is what's going to happen. Now, you know, modesty prevents them from actually saying, look, I'm running this thing, you know, just get used to it. So they, they, they play nice. and They say, well, it may, the crisis may be this time. It may. They, they count their terms when all the time they know what's going to happen. Uh, you know, they, they just know. So anyway, uh, what I've been saying for a long, long time, according to the plan, is uh, what will happen economically, you know, right after the 2014 election, down, 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 2016, here comes Jeb Bush, and he will be elected uh, with a plurality in the primaries, not a majority, a plurality in the primaries. Uh, and then uh, they dirtied up Hillary, so she won't be much of a factor, and that leaves uh, gaffing Joe Biden to stick his foot in his mouth over and over and over and over again. So he'll he's the plan loser. And so... What happens is uh, Jeb Bush uh, wins, and he will try, uh, I'm being facetious now, he will try valiantly to recover from the disaster, which is the last couple of years, meaning 2015, 2016, of the Obama uh, presidency, his second term. But, oh, my goodness, try as we might, we just can't pull this off because it's a global situation, you know, which, of course, the power elite gave us for this very reason. And so he will try and, but, oh, shucks, you know, we just, can't make the changes necessary. We tried, you know, but we're hooked up with Greece and everybody else, right? Okay, so uh, everybody goes in the tank, and my, 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 you know, what can we do? The dollar, the lira, the pound, the yen, and so forth and so on. The franc is all debauched and debased and so forth and so on. And so, gee, I guess for international transactions, we'll just have to go with the world currency, and what shall we call it? Let's call it the phoenix, you know, rising from the economic ashes of the past and so forth and so on. And so anyway, I've been through all this, and that's what's on the cover of the book. And so that's, uh, the reason I'm going through all this is it's one thing for me to say it. This is what I think is going to happen. This is a prediction, and I get the reasons. It's another thing when you actually hear a David Rockefeller say in his own words, secret cabal conspiring. So in this case... It's one thing for me to say economically such and such is going to happen. It's another thing for this fellow, this famed investor Jim Rogers, hooked up with George Soros, to say the same thing. You know, he says the same thing, and all of a sudden, woo, wow, look at that credibility. Wow. That, you know, for me to say it, who cares? But uh, for him to say it, it just adds uh, a note of emphasis, even though he uses these words like may and could and so on, that it's, uh, it's going to happen. Uh, if I could just comment for our listeners, they certainly can go up on your computer, go to your uh, search engine, and type in Jim Rogers' recent uh, interview uh, saying as in the uh, uh, of financial catastrophe coming, something like that, financial collapse. And it's well worthwhile reading what Jim Rogers says because he's actually saying that it's simply not a matter of it, but when this whole thing falls apart. And of course, what he's talking about is that we are losing the status. The dollar will no longer be the reserve currency of the world. Go right ahead. All uh, right. And the the rumor sort of is they'll try a basket of currencies, and they may do that. But you know that's not going to that's not going to get it either, because the the whole planned incompetency is that you know oh look we'll try a basket of currencies, and then somebody will say but uh, aren't all those currencies sort of debates? <laughs> so, well, yeah, you got a good point there. Gee, I guess we'll just have to have a new world currency. Yep, too bad. And of course, the reason they want the world currency is because once you have a global currency, then you lose a tremendous amount of your national sovereignty. You know, you're, you're hooked up with the management of the global currency. And so, you know, the people managing it, then, you know, guess who, right? The, the managers for the paralyte will be managing that. And then, of course, the managers will be managed by the paralyte themselves. And since they're, they're managing uh, this global currency, then they will get to say what's in your budget in Greece and our budget here and the budget in Japan and the budget everywhere. And once you get to this, you know, this group on high uh, telling the American people that you're no longer in control of your budget and what you can spend and not spend stuff on, we are, once you've done that, it's over. That's it. Goodbye. You know, no more sovereign America, no more sovereign Japan, sovereign Russia, sovereign anything. And that's the plan. That's the plan. Okay, now, when we get uh, uh, back uh, where we were last time, continuing in the book, uh, the power elite, their history and future, uh, we had gotten uh, so far into the uh, chapter on the Illuminati, 
where they're actually talking about what's occurring today. And that's why all of this is relevant. I mean, if I say, hey, let's talk about the Illuminati, it says, aren't they some sort of funny group 200 years ago? Well, yeah, they were 200 years ago, but what they did then is specifically occurring today. And there's a reason for that, and we'll pick up after the break. And what people really don't understand is that there is a small group of people who are totally dedicated uh, to the destruction of the sovereignty of this country, uh, the sovereignty throughout the world. They want a one world government, a one world financial system. They want to destroy Christianity because they certainly worship a different God. And if you doubt that, you go to the Trilateral Commission website, trilateral.org, and look at their logo. Three sixes joined together by an upside down broken cross. Dr. Kelly, you go right ahead. Uh, okay, and uh, just for a second, a minute, uh, picking up on what you just said about they are undermining national uh, sovereignty, uh, this is part of the plan. Now, that's not just myself saying that. Uh, uh, one of the people who was a member of Carl, uh, Cecil Rhodes Equal Society was Arnold Toynbee, and I uh, found a speech of his in Copenhagen in 1931, and he basically said, now this is 40 years after Cecil Rhodes founded a secret society. You know, if you talk to some of these Rhodes scholars, they poo-poo the idea of a conspiracy, and they'll say, well, yeah, Cecil Rhodes may have mentioned something like that, you know, because they can't really deny what Quigley wrote because he had the documents, right? So they try and, you know, deflect it by saying, well, yeah, I guess he did sort of think about that, but then he dropped the idea and decided to go with the Rhodes scholars and said, this is just a wonderful, happy, happy thing, and so just shut up and go away. And, but I'm not shutting up. <laughs> I'm going away, at least not, you know, willingly. And so what I'd like to point out to these guys is not only did William Stead, his right-hand man, afterwards say, no, you know, Milner executed it. We just didn't talk about it much because, you know, if you're forming a secret society and plotting something globally, you don't want to run your mouth about it or it wouldn't be, you know, secret. And uh, so the, the example I give is this Toynbee speech 40 years later, you know. So, I mean, if Cecil Rhodes' plan uh, to take over the world, you know, fancy the charm to young America to participate in the scheme to take the government of the whole world and will absorb the wealth of the world, those are two basic things Rhodes said. I mean, if he dropped that, then how come Toynbee, who's a member of the group 40 years later, is delivering this speech in Copenhagen in which he says specifically, specifically, uh, yeah, we're undermining national sovereignty, uh, but if they find out about it, we'll just lie. We'll lie with our lips about that, which we're trying to accomplish all uh, with all our might with our hands. That's his quote. That's what he says. So if Rhodes forgot it, about it, and Milner forgot about it. How come Toynbee, 40 years later, said, yep, yep, that's what we're up to in 1931? And then that was picked up 40 years later by Richard Gardner, you know, an end run around national sovereignty, eroding it piece by piece. And then the economic point of that, uh, he said, was GATT. I mean, that was what he was talking about. We used GATT to do it. And that's why Bill Clinton had to replace George H.W. Bush after just one term. You know, usually it's two terms. Two terms, Democrat, two terms, Republican, two terms, Democrat, two men. But this time, George H.W. Bush only had one term. Say, so, well, hey, you know what happened? What's the two terms? Well, at that point, they needed uh, a Democrat to twist enough Democrat arms. They had enough Republican arms. They didn't have enough Democrat arms to pass GATT, you know, NAFTA and GATT, which were very, very important to this global uh, machination they were going through to uh, ruin us and uh, force us into this global currency. And so that's what Gardner said. Uh, in running around national sovereignty, eroding it piece by piece, we'll get us much further than the old-fashioned frontal attack. And then he went on to explain how GATT would be a really, really important part of that. And it is. You got these unelected bureaucrats over there uh, making these decisions for the World Trade Organization, and we, the U.S., gets uh, you know voted down on these uh, decisions by about 80 mm, percent of the time. We only win like you know 20 percent of the cases. The rest of the time, you know, they say, "Uh-uh, you're wrong. Too bad. You got to change." Literally. I mean, they forced, I put examples in my book, The Globalist, how they forced us, forced us to change our law to be in compliance with GATT and the World Trade Organization. Now, once you've done that, I mean, you really are no longer completely sovereign. At this point, right now, we are no longer completely sovereign. You know, we have, you know, we still have some sovereignty, but that's what, you know, that's what the world currency is <laughs> going to cure, you know, cure, or, you know, whatever. You hold know. that thought, Dr. Cuddy, hold that thought. We'll be back here in just a moment here. Well, 
this is Dr. Stan, and Dr. Cuddy is simply just saying that people don't understand that the, the basic thrust of the people who control both political parties is to do away with national sovereignty. And basically today, America is the dominant a, a political, dominant military force in the world, but we are using certainly our military and financial power uh, to destroy the sovereignty of nations throughout the world, but they're also destroying our national sovereignty, and of course you do that by destroying our currency. That's why they're intentionally destroying our currency. Remember, it took them 200 years to get $1 trillion in debt. Now we get over a trillion dollars in debt every year. And this is designed to destroy the value of our currency because you have to destroy the currency before you can destroy the sovereignty. Destroy the currency while you destroy sovereignty. And then we're going to have to have some sort of a new one world currency going along with a one world tyrannical government that is being planned by this elite who, of course, hate, have an intense hatred of Christianity and of freedom. And remember that old adage, those who will not be ruled by God will be ruled by tyrants. And the tyrants are out there rubbing their hands together because everything is going their way because they can dominate our monetary system. They dominate certainly our media. They dominate our corporations. They have their people planted in our military, in our educational system, and even in our churches. Go right ahead, Dr. Cuddy. Uh, yeah, it is, it's a complete uh, scheme. Uh, you know, that's what uh, Rose said. Fancy the charm to young America to participate in a scheme. That was his word to take the government of the whole world. Yep. And so uh, people say, well, what's the, the Illuminati? They're these, you know, secretive guys 200 years ago, but they're gone and so on. No, 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 no. It's very, very relevant. So picking up with uh, my book, uh, The Power Elite, Their History and Future, which is offered by Radio Liberty. Uh, where we left off was exactly what is relevant to today, uh, because uh, Baron Adolf von Nigge, uh, K-N-I-G-G-E, his code name was Philo, was Weisop, uh, Adam Weisop, who founded the Illuminati in May 1st, uh, 1776, in anticipation of our uh, Declaration of Independence, which they knew was coming. Uh, he was uh, Weisop's second in command from 1780 to 1784. And according to John Robinson, who wrote that book, Proofs of a Conspiracy, back then, 1798, he said that uh, Von Nigge's uh, favorite scheme, that's a quote, his favorite scheme was to create, quote, citizens of the world. So, you see, that's what President Obama is talking about now, citizens of the world. Now, this isn't just a Democrat thing. I mentioned this before. This is just, oh, look, Obama, leftist, you know, socialist-leaning, moving this to socialism, Citizens of the world, sure, yeah, we anticipate that. Uh, no, no, no. Remember, they control both political parties. And so uh, I'm not going to belabor it, but I've mentioned in the past now the Secretary of Education under George H., uh, George W. Bush, George W. Bush is from Houston, said he, he, just George W. Bush's U.S. Secretary of Education, shortly after he came into office, said, We are so pleased, pleased to be rejoining UNESCO. Uh, because it'll give us a chance to have all our children made into citizens of the world. See? Same term. Doesn't matter, Republican, Democrat, doesn't matter. And that's why another Bush is really important. Really important. Uh, okay. Now, what I say there is, uh, whether it's, uh, the subject of world citizenship or abortion or women's liberation or some other issue today, you can probably trace its origins back to uh, being part of the Illuminati's plan. And that's what I've just uh, been going through the last uh, several weeks. Now, because world citizenship was an important part of their uh, plot, uh, just like it's you know an important part of the plan of the parallel today, it's also relevant, I think, uh, that shortly after Ernst von Guckhausen, I know a lot of these are German terms, his name is Ernest von Guckhausen, uh, was dismissed from the Illuminati, you know, they sort of kicked him out. He had a tiff, and he decided to write this novel where he was exposing, you know, what they're doing. He, he was very careful. You know, I'll put it in the form of a novel. I'll say it's, not, it's fiction. See, it's fiction, but it's really not. And his novel was called Exposure of the Cosmopolitan System in letters from ex-Freemasons. Now, that was published in 1786. You know, they, they you know, he... They got ticked off with something he was doing, so they kick him out. So he said, I'll fix those dirty guys. <laughs> and so he writes this novel in 1786. And uh, in there, uh, in, he states uh, there, there's a hero. There's a hero in the novel. And the hero asks his superior this question in the novel, quote, 
What purpose do the Illuminati have in infiltrating and dominating Masonry? That's the question. And the response was, the response of the superior to the hero was, quote, to emancipate all of mankind from religious and political slavery, end quote. And then the superior continued, and we'll pick up after the break. All right, fine, because our guest is Dr. Dennis Cuddy. And we're talking certainly about the fact that there really is a small, well-organized group intent upon taking this into this one world government. But what people don't understand, most people writing about it, is that most of these people are demonically possessed. And we are seeing the fulfillment of the ancient prophecies, talking about this move towards the one world government and certainly the one world currency and the castless society. Dr. Cuddy, go right ahead. Uh, okay, um, in this this novel, which is really uh, the, you know revealing what they were actually doing, the superior uh, to the hero is responding to the hero's question, and the superior says, "Quote: When nations are no longer separated from one another, when citizens are no longer influenced by the exclusive interest of any state or the parochial sentiment of patriotism, world citizenship. That's what you'll have." What does it mean? You are either a citizen or you are a rebel. There is no third choice, in quote. And so that's what they have planned for us today. And it goes right back to the Illuminati. Now, in, uh, concerning the strategies of the Illuminati, they're very, very similar to those of the power elite today. And it's not by accident. Uh, for example, the Illuminati adopted the, the Machiavellian concept that uh, the ends justify the means. And that's, of course, contrary to the biblical admonition uh, that one should not do evil, that good may come from it. That's in the Bible. Uh, today, uh, you can see uh, some of the parallel activities regarding uh, population control, for example, as exhibiting uh, the same perspective of the ends justify the means. Yeah. It's like they'll say, well, it's unfortunate that we have to deny food and you know, all of these things we're doing, but hey, you know, the ends are are good, so these things happen. So like when David Rockefeller said Chairman Mao was doing a real good job, he wrote that August 10th, uh, 1973 uh, column in the New York Times where he said, hey, they may have a few problems, but basically Mao's done a real good job over there in China, and that's after everybody knew that tens of millions of his own people have been, you know, killed and starved to death and everything else. So it's typical. You know, the ends justify the means. You know, there may there may be these difficulties, but hey, you know, in the end, it's all for the good. <laughs> That's their perspective. You no, know, few million people die, but yeah, we got too many people anyway. Sort of like the Georgia Guidestones, right? Okay. Now, the plot, uh, of course, the Illuminati uh, began to be exposed uh, uh, by the what was called the Bavarian Court of Inquiry, and they commenced their investigation early on in 1783 during that uh, time of the Illuminati. And it took them uh, about three years uh, to, to finish it. And hold the thought. Hold that thought. We'll be back here in just a moment. Well, this is Dr. Stan. And, Chris, Dr. Cuddy is simply talking about the historical background of this move towards world government and how this existed back in 1776 with the Illuminati. I said the Adam Wise help created the Illuminati with this idea of bringing about the world government. Remember, the Illuminati was formed on May 1, 1776. America was created on July 4, 1776, with the Declaration of Independence. So, on one hand, you had the people who wanted to, for the mankind to be free, a sovereign nation. On the other hand, you had this group of people who wanted a one world government under a ruling elite and with the destruction of Christianity because the two of them go close together, which is exactly why they took God and prayer and the Ten Commandments out of our, our schools here, why they've undermined certainly the religious belief here, why they've changed both the music and the message of the Christian church, the modern day church. Dr. Kennedy, go right ahead. You were talking about the Illuminati and certainly how it was investigated back in 1783 after it had been exposed that this was a subversive group moving to bring about a world government at that time and to destroy national sovereignty. This discourse is going on today, but go right ahead, Dr. Cuddy. Uh Yeah, and um, uh, somebody may say, well, they were made. First, 1776, and our Declaration of Independence wasn't until December 4th, so, you know, <clears throat> it, it can't be the way I'm saying it. Well, what you have to understand is back then you had a sort of slow motion historical flow 
that did, did not result in just all of a sudden, all of a sudden, out of the blue, boing, a declaration of independence out of nowhere. Uh, apparently, as I call them, they knew that the declaration was coming. Uh, in fact, the declaration wasn't the first declaration. There was something uh, in the state where I am called the Mecklenburg Resolve, which was basically the Declaration of Independence on the state level here. So it's not like the Illuminati was in the dark, uh, and the paralete was in the dark about this upcoming declaration. I mean, the handwriting was on the wall. So when they formed in May 1st of 1776, the Illuminati, they knew what was coming. I mean, it was just a matter of time, you know, whether it was July 4th or July 13th or June 30, 30th or something, it didn't matter. They knew it was coming, and so that's uh, why the Illuminati was formed, uh, May 1st of 1776. And so they, they begin, and then there's an investigation. And the investigation, see, back then you didn't have instant communication, so it, take, you know, it takes a while to do things back then. And so they began this uh, board, uh, Bavarian Court of Inquiry in 1783, and it took them a while, about three years, and they finally, in 1786, uh, decreed the abolishment of the Illuminati. Of course, that didn't mean, you know, rounding them all up and doing a, uh, you know, Jacques de Molay burn them at the stake thing like they did in 1313. Uh, but the, the guys just dispersed. I mean, they just, you know, it's sort of like the multi-headed hydra. It's, it's sort of like the, when the alleged trust buster, uh, Teddy Roosevelt, uh, busted up Standard Oil, he didn't do anybody any favors. He, you know, just dispersed them into various uh, groupings and various sub-corporations, and they had interlocking directorates, so they became a multi-headed hydra, which is more difficult to keep track of anyway. So he didn't bust, you know, bust, I mean, technically he broke them up, but, they, you know, they, they didn't go away. They just uh, became a hydra uh, for those who are, you know, no biology and what little hydra looks like, multi-headed, you know, from the same root, but multi, multi-headed. And so that's what they did. And so the same thing with these guys. The Illuminati just dispersed. You know, they became the Parisian Outlaws League. They had infiltrated the free Freemasonry and, and so forth. And they would spread all over to Russia and everywhere else, Switzerland, so forth. Okay. So uh, they were allegedly abolished in uh, 1786. And, uh, of course, there had already been some friction, you know, the, the strategy, what to do and all that between Oh, uh, Weishaupt and this Baron Adolf von Digekold, the codename Philo. And now, uh, he had been, uh, Philo, the codename, his, uh, second in command. He was initiated into the Illuminati in July 1780, and he was the second in command. And, but, uh, four years later, four years later, on April 20th of 1784, he resigned. Well, why did he resign? I thought they were buddies. Oh, uh, Weishaupt had a particular direction and dictatorial management style. And uh, uh, Philo, as his code name is, he didn't like that. And what he did was, uh, that was revealed in something uh, that was published in 1787 called the Supplement of Further Original Works. You know, these, these guys didn't just go quietly into the night. They published their critiques and, and whatever. And so uh, that was 1787. And then the next year, 1788, uh, Baron Von Degas, coaching Philo, he wrote this regarding the order. Remember, that's what they called themselves, the order. They didn't run around saying, I'm an Illuminist, an Illuminati guy. They say, the order says this, the order that. So in 1788, uh, Philo uh, writes, quote, As a rule, under the veil of secrecy, dangerous plans and harmful teachings can be accepted just as well as noble intentions and profound knowledge because not all members themselves are informed of such depraved intentions, which sometimes tend to lie hidden beneath the beautiful facade, in quotes. See? So he's revealing, because he got ticked off with <laughs> Weissop in his style, he's actually revealing what they were up to, you know, how sneaky they were. And I give the, the source of that. The source of that is a book by Stephen Lookert. Uh, it's, it's actually a dissertation. And it was titled Jesuits, Freemasonries, Illuminatis, and Jacobins. Subtitled Conspiracy Theories, Secret Societies, and Politics of the Late 18th Century Germany. Now, they always had these long titles on these dissertations. Okay, now, in the same year, uh, 1787, that the supplement of further original works was published, uh, so also was uh, something titled Original Writings of the Illuminati. Uh, and that was published in Munich by Johann Strobel. Now, his code name was, I guess you could say it, Edilis, E-D-I-L-E-S, Edilis, Edilis. 
he was dismissed from the order in 1783. See, all these, these guys who get uh, ticked off with the Illuminati because they, they're up to something or don't like what Weissop's doing and they get dismissed, they, they do a sort of a revenge thing. And so in 1783, this guy, he gets dismissed, and he becomes an ardent opponent uh, of the Illuminati. And even though the Illuminati had been abolished in uh, 1786 officially, uh, Weissop himself already had a plan for its continuation. And so there was another fellow, same time, <clears throat> in the same year as uh, John Robinson wrote his Proofs of a Conspiracy, and the same fellow, Augustine uh, Barul, Barul, he wrote that same year, 1798, what he called Memoirs Illustrating the History of Jacobinism. Jacobinism. And in there, Weissop is quoted as stating, quote, I have foreseen everything, and I have prepared everything. Let my whole order go to rack and ruin. In three years, I will answer to restore it, and that to a more powerful state than it is at present. And so didn't the Jacobins basically take up where the Illuminists had left yep. off? Yep, that, that was the, the, the sort of uh, movement, uh, as it was called during the French Revolution, the Jacobin uh, movement, yeah. And because, because the Illuminati had infiltrated the Freemasonic lodges and stirred up the revolution and, and so forth. So, okay, now he continues this quote. I, this is Weissop, I shall rise stronger than ever. I can sacrifice whole provinces. The desertion of a few individuals, therefore, will not alarm me, in quote. See, he's already anticipated their uh, exposing, uh, being exposed, and what would happen to them, and this, 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 the disbursement of what he's, he's already got this plan down the road. That's why whenever you have this, this sort of stupid incompetence that goes on in the current political scene, uh, you know, I say, I ask myself, you guys got to be kids. You, you can't, you can't possibly be this stupid. I mean, look at, um, uh, look at Benghazi. I've said this before. They're still piddling around trying to find out, golly, what went wrong in Benghazi? Do you really believe that? I mean, imagine George Patton, General George Patton, getting surprised by some, you know, uh, German attack by Rommel or somewhere. Do you think George Patton's going to wait around? Gee, you know, this will take us six months or a year or so. Uh, we got to figure out what went wrong. Well, basically, because Dennis, this is one of the most clever things. They keep going back to Benghazi, focusing our attention on Benghazi, so we won't think about really important things. <laughs> <laughs> the, the media is controlled. They f focus our attention on whatever they want us to think about, and the really important things that are going to change the course of a civilization are totally ignored. Yeah, and, and like like I was saying, do you really believe any of you remember old you know George Patton, uh, general of uh, the U.S. forces, a general in World War II? If he got outsmarted, I mean, if he got outsmarted by Rommel, for example, do you really think he'd sit around for six months or so wondering, golly, I wonder what went wrong? It's incredible, but we're supposed to believe that today. We're supposed to believe that these dummies in Congress and, you know, in the, the Obama administration, they're still trying to figure out what went wrong, you know. <laughs> and the American public apparently are buying this. Yeah, yeah, we'll have to investigate that. Let's take six months. Hey, what the heck? Let's take a year. I mean, if you're a terrorist, you got to be laughing your head off. You're, you're laughing. You're saying, you mean these, these idiots haven't figured out what went wrong? Hey, let's hit them again, <laughs> you know, and again, and again, and again, and again. So anyway, it's all a, it's all a farce. But the American public has been so dumbed down that the, the people actually believe that. They actually believe it's taking us six months or whatever to find out what went wrong. We know what went wrong. <laughs> wrong is all part of our plan. So anyway, all right, now with the abolishment of the Illuminati in Bavaria in 1786, uh, Weissop, of course, he had to, you know, flee. Uh, I mean, they weren't going to kill him or anything, but he, you know, they, they had to move around, you know, disperse. So when Weissop fled, he fled to the court of uh, Saxe Gotha, S A X E hyphen Gotha. And that was under the uh, protection of uh, one of these, you know, the nobility. They're, they're always get their nobility in league with this stuff. And this particular one was the Duke Ludwig Ernst II. And who's he? Well, he ruled there at Saxe Gotha and was a high-ranking Illuminatus himself. And his code name was Quintus Severus, uh, or Timoleon. 
Timoleons. They all had these, you know, either Latin or whatever, Greek or these code names. And Aaron the, the second, he had been initiated into the Illuminati, sort of, not at the first, he was in 1783, he was sort of a Johnny come lately. And uh, today's uh, British royal family are his direct descendants. Huh? How about that? You got your suspicions about the British royal family? Yep, they're the directly descendants of Ernst the second. And uh, according to uh, Rene Le Forestier, yeah, let me pronounce this right, Le Forestier, T-I-E-R, not Forester, but Forestier, in his book, this is written in French, Les Illumines de Bavière et la France Maçonnerie Allemande, you know, that's French basically in Germany. In 1915, Ernst II, on February 25 of 1777, had become a member of the Strict observant Masonic Lodge. See, they all, the Illuminati is infiltrating these lodges. So Ernst II had become a strict observance member, and that's, you know, I mean, that's, that's you know, I've, I've talked about the strict observance lodge, some of the Americans at that time being a member of that. That's like really, really super duper secret type. So he became a member of the strict observance Masonic Lodge, and a banquet table was brought in where he was, uh, having the shape of a T, like the capital letter T, and what you got to know about that is that is a symbol noticeable uh, on monuments of the old Knights Templar, see, so there's another link, the unique link between the Knights Templar and here in the Illuminati, they, you know, this is not accidental. Now, taking over the Illuminati leadership as uh, uh, Weisop, uh fled to, to this uh, Duke's place, Zach Gotha, in 1786 with another fellow, uh, Johann Bode, B-O-D-E. Uh, and his code name was uh, Emilius uh, Wien, Wienfried, Fried, Wien, W-I-N-E-F-R-I-E-D, Wienfried. And in 1787, that fellow, uh, Johann Bode, he founded a branch of the Illuminati in Les Amis Reunis Lodge in Paris. Uh, that means Les Amis means uh, the friends, uh, the Reunited Friends Lodge in Paris, translating. Uh, Bode adopted uh, the name uh, Philadelphia, like Philadelphia, the Philadelphia. Uh, rather than Illuminati in France. You know, change the name to protect the guilty, <laughs> so we take up a new name. So they called themselves, instead of uh, Illuminati, they called themselves the Philadelphia in France. And in an interview with uh, Charles Porcet uh, about uh, 15 or so years ago, in the December 1995 edition of Humanisme, Humanisme, that's like uh, humanism, Humanisme, that's a publication of the Grand Orient Masonic Lodge of France, in there, there's a reference to a 1789 document holding that the Philadelphians were responsible for the French Revolution, which began that year, which, you know, makes sense, because that's what the Illuminati was up to, stirring up the revolution. Uh, now, it's entirely logical, in my opinion, that the Illuminati would be a prime instigator of that the revolution. Uh, why? Well, yeah, I mean, just look at the theory of uh, the French philosopher Jean-Jacques Rousseau, uh, who greatly influenced Weisop. Uh, Rousseau was a big influence on Weisop, and uh, he inspired Rousseau to the, the French Revolution. Uh, in addition, according to uh, uh, the Librarian of Congress, who Dr. Stan and I found very helpful, uh, Rose Scholar James Billington, according to Billington in The Fire in the Minds of Men, which was published big, thick book in 1980, quote, this is what Billington wrote, Rose Scholar, Billington, Librarian of Congress, uh, uh, the hit, uh, the, uh, he said, quote, it was Jacobin and French revolutionist Honoré Mirabeau. That's one of the famous names, Mirabeau, you know, like with Condorcet and the, 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 these other uh, encyclopedists, Diderot, and so on. He says, it was uh, Honoré uh, Mirabeau's evoca evocative language and his popularization of illuminous concepts that during the early years of the revolution, French Revolution, Swayed many of the conspirators in Paris. So here you have Billington acknowledging the Jacobin French Revolutionist influence and that they are conspirators and that they were illuminists. And so Billington knows perfectly well himself what's going on. And then, according to prominent Freemasons, this is a Freemason, prominent Freemasons, Marquis de Luchet, L U C H E T. Now, this is not, you know, some average Freemason. This is a guy who is powerful enough to uh, gain the uh, position of bibliotech for Voltaire. Now, bibliotech means like your head librarian, basically what that word means. So this guy is really, really prominent, and so he gets this high-level job for Voltaire. And so and he's a prominent Freemason. 
According to him, in the first year of the revolution, French Revolution, which was 1789, he warned in his book, in his book, in Essay sur la secte des Illuminés, he warned that book, uh, about the infiltration of the Illuminati into the Masonic lodges. Now, here's a Mason talking about the Illuminists sneaking into his lodges. And this is what he said. He says, quote, now this is, remember, this is 1789. He says, you who are misled, or could be, know that there is a conspiracy. This is him talking, 1789. It was formed, he's writing this, it was formed in the deepest darkness, a secrecy of new beings who know each other without being seen, who understand each other without explanation, who serve without friendship. The goal of the society is world government. That's what he said, world government. Taking over the authority of sovereigns, taking their place, and leaving them nothing more than the empty honor of wearing the crown, end quote. So he, he's a prominent Freemason, and he knew what the Illuminati was up to back in 1789. And the same thing is going on today, and of course the financial and military power of the United States is being used to bring about this one world government. Why do you think we have our troops sent all throughout the world to bring about the world government? Dr. Cuddy, you've got three minutes to wrap up the program. Okay, well, I'll just uh, finish up by continuing what I was saying, how they spread, the Illuminati dispersed. Uh, they not only spread to France, but uh, other countries. And according to the Forestier that I mentioned, uh, King Frederick, uh, Frederick William II of Prussia wrote to uh, Frederick Augustus I, who was the elector of uh, Saxony. He wrote this so on October 3rd of 1789. This is what he's writing. He wrote that he had been formed that, quote, a Masonic sect, S-E-C-T, who were called Illuminati or Minervals, after having been expelled from Bavaria, have become formidable and have spread rapidly throughout the whole of Germany and into neighboring countries, in quote. So they knew by 1789 what the Illuminati was up to. They were simply dispersing into not only France, but Germany. And in Germany, the philosophical Jacobin uh, named Johann Gottlieb Ficht, F-I-C-H-T-E, he was not a member of the Illuminati himself, uh, but uh, was accused of having sympathy for them, Fick actually developed the dialectical process uh, before George Hegel did. You know, the Hegelian dialectic, Fick actually did it before him, uh, to, before Hegel, to whom this process is attributed. That's the process. Uh, Terry Pinkard, in his book, Hegel, A Biography, 2001, revealed that Hegel was mentored by Illuminati member Jacob Abel. His code name was Pythagoras Abderitis. And so uh, we'll continue next time. But you see these connections? Back then, their disbursements, the code names, they've changed their names, but they, they continue, Germany, elsewhere, dispersing, according to Weissop's plan. Remember, Weissop said, you destroy us, I've already planned for it, I've already, I'm going to come back even stronger and live on, and that's what they've done. And they are working today, certainly their descendants, you know, here we are, what, well over 200 years later, and yet, of course, they, the whole plan is coming together. We're drawing ever closer towards yep. the establishment of the one world government. Would you agree? Absolutely. That's the plan. Okay. Any parting thoughts, or should we just let you go? Well, just remember uh, what uh, Jim Rogers said, and I said it uh, before him, what the plan is, 2015, 2016, uh, you know, things go downhill. And what I'm saying is uh, Jeb Bush will come in, probably Bush, doesn't have to be, and by 2018 uh, things will be so disastrous that they'll, they'll have to accept the world currency, and that'll basically be it for our national sovereignty and all the other nations of the world. God bless. Thanks very much, Dr. Kelly. We'll look forward to talking to you again next week. Thanks for having me. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. Well, this is Dr. Stan, and of course, as you look and see what's happening with Obamacare, and you understand basically here we, where they have this system, uh, this computerized system people are supposed to sign up on, they can't sign up on it. More and more people are going on to Medicaid. Doctors are simply dropping out of the system. Hospitals are dropping out of the system. Uh, the cost of health care is going to skyrocket for everybody who's not already on Medicare. As I pointed out earlier, my son's insurance went from 
$4,000 a year to 14000 and this is being paralleled all throughout the entire country. And people are saying, gee, how could they have made such a terrible mistake? How could they have done such a bad job? And the answer is they didn't do a bad job. They know exactly what they're doing. This is designed to fail. It's like the agreement with Iran, ladies and gentlemen. If you look at it, what did we do? What did we accomplish? Why? Why we got the uh, Iranians to say, well, we're not going to be um, getting any more new centrifuges. And our inspectors are going to be able to look at some of the sites, but not all of the sites. And we know the Iranians are not going to abide by the agreement. It's designed to fail. They know exactly what they're doing. They just don't want you to know that they know what they're doing. Their ultimate goal is a one world government, a one world the city financial system and that's why they've set out to destroy the value of our country and impoverish the American people and if you're not involved in getting this information, checking and find out if what you were telling you is true and then suddenly join us in this epic struggle for the survival of Christian civilization then you become certainly part of the problem Men and women become accomplices to the evils they fail to oppose. And if you're not involved, then of course you will have no one to blame. When of course the destruction, the, our wonderful, wonderful society is destroyed. How do we understand what's going on? Well, you need to get my book, Brotherhood of Darkness. You need to get certainly the book by our good friend James Perloff, Truth is a Lonely Warrior. Truth is a Lonely Warrior. And then you need to get certainly Dr. Cuddy's books, The Power Elite, and The Secret Nazi Plan, and The Power Elite, Their History, and Their Future. That's The Power Elite and The Secret Nazi Plan, and The Power Elite and the, uh, Their History and Their Future. Uh, the books are available by calling 1-800-544-8927. 8927 Tomorrow is the certainly... At Pearl Harbor Day, and we have an excellent four CD set, or I should say four tape set, on Pearl Harbor with interviews I did with people who studied what happened and the fact that they intentionally left our boys there to die. They knew the attack was coming. They knew when it was coming. But they didn't tell the commanders at Pearl Harbor because they wanted to kill a lot of young men. So we would then be propelled into a war just like they left the people in the Twin Towers there on September 11, 2001, you needed an excuse to get us to go to war. Certainly, oh, they had 19 hijackers, we were told. 15 of them came from Saudi Arabia, so we immediately attacked Afghanistan. And, of course, those six of the hijackers who died that day have come back to life. If you doubt it, go up on the Internet. Simply type in six 9-11 hijackers living in the Middle East today. You'll find it's true. And then, of course, go to the Trilateral Commission website. Go to trilateral.org. Trilateral.org and look at their logo. Three sixes joined together by an upside-down broken cross. So you need to get the information, and then we hope many of you out there will have the courage to join us in this epic struggle for the survival of Christian civilization and the souls of men. And basically, you can join the Radio Liberty family of supporters. You can buy our products. You can get our health care products. Uh, you can get the spices we offer, the Berkey water filters, the Miracle 2 soap products. All of these things, of course, go to provide the funds to maintain our network of stations all across America. We're five hours every day, five days a week. We bring the people the news behind the news, the story behind the story. So basically, of course, if you're in a position to help us financially, we would really appreciate it. If you're not in a position to help us, then we ask you to pray for Radio Liberty, to pray for our provision and for our protection. And so until tomorrow, I guess until Monday at the same time, Dr. Stan, goodbye, and, and may the Lord be with you.